On May the 2nd, 1945, RAF Liberator serial number KH210, identified as R for Robert, of 355 Squadron, ditched in the Bay of Bengal. There were only two survivors, gunner Eric Kitely and co-pilot Mick Pullen. Among the ten crew members who perished was James Nicholson, the only pilot in RAF Fighter Command to be awarded the Victoria Cross during the war. This was for his action during the Battle of Britain, when, despite being badly burned and with the cockpit in flames, he downed an ME-110. After bailing out, an over-enthusiastic home guard shot him in the backside as he parachuted to earth, mistaking him for an enemy pilot. Eric Kiley would have been just 18 years old at this point in the war. In the 1980s, Robert Taylor captured the scene with this limited edition print, and each one is signed by Eric. Several years later, Nicholson and Kiley would meet in RAF Salbani, West Bengal, India. According to Eric, Nicholson was a very modest, likeable character and was very approachable. And in fact, he appeared at times to almost be embarrassed by the VC award, saying that there were plenty of other pilots who were more deserving than him. I tried to discover what had prompted Eric to volunteer for service. Coventry, which is about 10 miles south of Eric's hometown of Nuneaton, suffered a devastating raid in November 1940, which destroyed the cathedral and caused a firestorm and the deaths of 500 civilians. Nuneaton suffered numerous attacks in the first couple of years of the Blitz, and this picture was taken from Riversley Road and Church Street, and today this area is a car park, and in the background is St Nicholas Parish Church, which somehow escaped being destroyed. On a more personal note, and I'm not aware of the timing, but his girlfriend, later his wife, had a lucky escape when an incendiary bomb crashed through her bedroom and uh, came to rest in the living room underneath in front of the fireplace. Unfortunately, it didn't ignite, and her father put it in a bucket of water and took it outside. However, the worst raid occurred on the night of May the 17th, 1941, when, according to the organisation Nuneaton Memories, 130 of the town's inhabitants lost their lives and 380 houses were destroyed and many thousands more damaged. I used to walk home down this street in the evenings from school and, like I imagine most of the customers in Franny Annis today, I had no idea of the extent of the damage or the history of this area. Coincidentally or not, three weeks after the May 17th raid, Eric went to the recruiting centre in Coventry and signed up for the RAF Volunteer Reserve. And less than six weeks later, he was called up and assigned to air gunnery for the duration of the emergency. And at the time, he wasn't quite 19 years old, and I imagine had no idea that that would mean five years. After completing initial training in Blackpool, he served in various locations around the UK before attending gunnery school. He kept a lot of the notebooks and manuals, which are quite interesting from a technical standpoint. There are diagrams depicting the cone of fire and strafing recommendations, how to estimate the range of enemy aircraft using the gun sight, and the mechanics and hydraulics of the various gun turrets in use at that time. The sketch showing the course of pursuit of an attacking fighter is interesting, in that by the time Eric was in combat, the Japanese pilots had learned that attacking from the rear exposed them to the air gunner's fire for way too much time, and so they generally attacked from the front instead. From March the 12th to May the 6th, 1944, he attended an aerial gunnery course at RAF Bishop's Court in Northern Ireland, where he completed 21 flights aboard Avro Ansons in preparation for his operational assignment. He sent a standard format postcard informing his mother of his deployment overseas before shipping out to Bombay via the Suez Canal. In Bombay, he apparently did a little sightseeing and then took the train to the RAF Heavy Conversion Unit 1673, based in Kolar, southern India. This was where the airmen were introduced to the larger four-engine bombers and where they formed up into crews. 
This photograph shows Sergeants Potter, Don Cameron, Bob Bell, Eric and Larry Halsby, just prior to their departure for Solbani. With the exception of Sergeant Potter, who doesn't appear to have stayed with the group, these guys would feature many more times in Eric's photo album, logbook and diary entries. Eric's logbook shows him completing his initiation flight aboard a Liberator on the 27th of September 1944 with Flight Lieutenant Higgins. After being teamed up with Gerald D'Souza for more familiarisation flights, the newly formed crew flew to Salbani, or Salboni as it's sometimes called, near Calcutta in West Bengal and prepared for operational flights. By the time of Eric's arrival, the Japanese land forces had already been heavily defeated at the battles of Kohima and Imphal, where they had unsuccessfully attempted to invade India, and the 14th Army under General Slim was steadily advancing from the west and north in pursuit. Slim's goal was to destroy the Japanese forces in Burma and to recapture the strategic port of Rangoon before the start of the monsoon the following May. Salbani itself was very undeveloped, as witnessed by some of the photographs in Eric's album. In addition to the incredible heat and humidity, the threat of contagious disease was ever-present. Wartime artist Frank Wotton spent time at the base while Eric was there, and his paintings reflect the conditions that the Grand Crews had to work in. The base was served by RAF squadrons 355 and 356 in addition to other squadrons on occasion. 355 libs were identified by vertical white stripes on the tail, while 356 had a large white cross. The crews came from UK, Canada, Australia and New Zealand, and in Gerald D'Souza's case, India. They were tasked with strategic missions to disrupt the Japanese lines of supply by bombing bridges, railways, trains, etc., and also tactical missions to support the Allied troops on the ground. The Allies had largely gained air superiority by this point, but accidents and enemy flak would take a large toll on the squadron. Records show of the 95 Liberators flown by 355 Squadron, 27 would be lost. The crews undertook dinghy training for the eventuality of ditching. I found a poster with some very optimistic instructions. It was well known by this time that the B-24 would break its back on impact and sink almost immediately, resulting in very few survivors. But the worst worry was a crash landing in the jungle, where even if you survive the impact, your wounds would almost certainly become infected, and you would face starvation or capture. The crews were aware of the conditions that the POWs suffered under the Japanese. I was told that some of them elected to carry cyanide pills hidden in a button, but I haven't been able to confirm that. Eric took a survival course which taught some key phrases in Burmese and the crews were given Japanese occupation currency to pay the locals if needed. I used period correct maps and place names to be consistent with his logbook and so for example Thailand is called Siam and Myanmar is referred to as Burma. And also, I apologise in advance for any mispronunciation of the place names. Here's some Australian War Memorial films showing the crew of uh, one of the Liberators in Salbani. It's a picture of Gerald D'Souza on the left and possibly Mick Pullen on the right. And here's the ground crew of KH-210 with Flying Officer Todd. This is from my dad's photo album. His first operation on November the 16th, 1944 would take over 12 and a half hours and was an attack on the railway repair shops at Pitsanaluk in Siam. 11 aircraft were involved, although only eight made it to the target. The other three returning to base for various reasons. I assume from the entry in his flight log, noting 150 foot height, and a photograph of the rolling stock that then made a low-level strafing attack as well. His second mission on November the 19th was against the railway yards at Mok Palin 
at the southern end of the Sitang River. Liberators from 355 and 356 were accompanied by P-47 Thunderbolt fighters. Dust and smoke from an earlier US raid hung over the target. The formation was attacked by two Nakajima Ki-43 Hayabusa fighter aircraft, known as Oscars to the Allies. One of the Oscars turned away after its initial dive through the formation, and the second was driven off by the Thunderbolts. The raid on the railway yards was considered a success. Prior to the end of the year, he completed more training flights and then two operations targeting railways and ammunition dumps in Taungup in Burma. There were no missions for Eric on Christmas Day and he appears to have spent some time with Mick Pullen who looks like he's enjoying a beer here as they're lying on a charpoy, a bed. And here is a picture of Nick, I assume he's Don Nicholson, and Snowy. We'll hear more about these guys later. In addition to his flight log, starting in January 1945, he made notes in a pocket diary. And although the entries are really brief, they do provide some insight into daily life. And one thing that struck me was how important his family was, and of course his fiancée, um, during this period and in the first eight months of the year he received over 200 letters from home plus newspapers and magazines. He also enjoyed seeing films um, and I can only imagine what an escape that must have been from the pressures that they experienced in combat and the realities of life being so far from home. He started the new year with a week's leave in Lucknow with some of his crew. Here's a photo of Eric with Larry Helsby and Bob Bell, and Eric taking a ride in the wagon, and also some shots of the beautiful architecture in Lucknow. After returning to base, his first mission of 1945 on January the 16th was the Japanese-held airstrip at Zayat Quinn in southern Burma. The crews were surprised to see such little opposition and there's a newspaper article saying pretty much the same thing. Liberators from 355 Squadron were accompanied by RAF Thunderbolts and US P-38 Lightning Fighters. Zeitquin would later be taken over by the Allies in support of the planned liberation of Rangoon. Two days later, he was involved in a raid on Kiongon Airfield, where they were again escorted by RAF Thunderbolt Fighters. During the next sortie to Amarapura on the outskirts of Mandalay on January the 21st, they were hit by shrapnel, which ricocheted off a metal can next to co-pilot Mick Pullen's leg before hitting Gerald D'Souza, the captain, who apparently escaped injury. They had targeted rail lines and installations. On January the 31st, his mission in cooperation with US B-24s was against the Japanese headquarters for Mandalay at Kiyoks or Kayoks, and this received quite a bit of press coverage at the time. From the numbers on the aerial photographs, it appears they'd been armed with nine one thousand and three five hundred pound bombs. His diary records the films that he saw. Some of these movies were better than others, but Copyright laws apparently prevent me from passing on his comments. Anyway, here's Going My Way with Bing Crosby, Four Jills in a Jeep, and Jack London. He must have seen his in Lucknow, first week in January. And then Kismet, Christmas Holiday, and This Is The Life. And then George Formby in Get Cracking, Fanny by Gaslight, and The Story of Dr. Wassell with Gary Cooper. In February, the weather was more conducive to offensive operations on the ground and in the air, and the number of raids picked up. The 14th Army under General Slim was making good progress on the ground. Slim's strategy was to convince the Japanese leadership that Mandalay was his prime target, but in reality he planned to take Maikitila in the south to cut off the Japanese line of supply. 
On the 5th of February, Eric flew a mission against ammunition dumps and stores in Medea, which is about 18 miles north of Mandalay, in support of the 14th Army's advance. 24 Liberators were involved from the two squadrons. KH-210 had been armed with 12 500-pound bombs. Then three days later, Japanese troop concentrations in Singu were the target. Here they met with flak, although reportedly none of the 24 Liberators was hit. The recon photos show that they've been armed with 10 1,000 and two 500 pound bombs. On February 11th, the largest air attack of the Burma campaign to date targeted fuel and oil dumps in Rangoon, which was a key link in the Japanese supply lines and therefore usually aggressively defended. B-29 superfortresses from the US 20th Bomber Command drenched an area north of the city with high explosive bombs. An hour later, RAF Liberators escorted by Thunderbolts and Lightning Fighters targeted the same area, followed by more Liberators from the US, US 7th Bombardment Group. It turned out to be one of the most hazardous operations that Eric had been involved with so far. His formation was met with accurate intense flak, and they were also attacked by a number of Japanese fighters. His diary says 11. Two of the fighters were destroyed with Eric claiming a probable. On the ground, huge fires erupted with smoke rising to 8,000 feet. As his diary states, what an operation today. Several more missions to Rangoon would follow. Four days later, tactical sorties were flown against Japanese admin offices at Kiecha and troop concentrations, and according to the newspaper report, oil field installations in Yinangyong. KH-210 was again hit by flak. His next mission targeted Japanese troop concentrations at Mayitha as part of a combined US and RAF operation. In addition to eight 1,000 pound bombs and four 500 pound bombs, KH-210 also dropped several thousand propaganda leaflets known as Nichols. From what I've managed to translate so far, it appears that the goal was to convince the Japanese that they were fighting a losing battle, but that they would be fed and treated fairly if they surrendered. Each type of nickel had a reference number, and from the operational record books, we can see that KH-210 dropped SBN-18, SJ-68 and SB-49. Eric kept examples of many of these, I assume as mementos. The following day, on February the 22nd, they flew a tactical mission against Japanese troops who were digging in around the ancient pagoda in Kangmador or Kangmudan in response to the advancing Allied forces, which were less than a mile away. There's a newspaper article about this mission claiming that following a request from religious leaders, the crews had skillfully avoided hitting the shrine, a demonstration of precision bombing. Eric's diary simply says, hit large pagoda. While it's still standing, so I did a little more research. In fact, three bombs hit the foundation walls, but the building didn't collapse. The opportunity for propaganda, however, was too good to pass over, and the authorities printed the story in the local Calcutta paper which was read later with some amusement in the squadron mess. Eric's final mission of February targeted stores and troops in Torn Gyi. Sixteen liberators from both squadrons were involved in this raid. So in between raids he managed to see a couple of films Betty Grable in Pin Up Girl and Albert Costello in Society. On March the 2nd, he was on a night raid on the railway workshops in Bangkok, which took over 13 hours to complete. Pathfinder aircraft had laid down incendiaries and bombs from the 18 liberators on the mission were seen to fall into the fires. On the ground, Mike Teeler was taken by General Slim in the first four days of March 1945. On March the 9th, Eric's mission was again the supply dumps. 
and 22 Liberators from 355 and 356 squadrons were accompanied to Rangoon by 40 American Mustang fighters. They attacked Rangoon again on the 17th and then Bangkok, again targeting supply dumps. This time the mission took 13 hours and 35 minutes. His diary reads, boy was I tired. Elsewhere, on March 28th, members of the Burmese National Army rose up and killed their Japanese officers to throw their support behind the Allies. And then on the 29th of March, Mandalay was taken by Slim's army. On a lighter note, here are some of the films that he saw. Bob Hope, Princess and a Pirate, Two Girls and a Sailor and Two Thousand Women. Having completed 20 missions, Eric and most of the crew were granted leave and went to what's known as a hell station in the Himalayan foothills of Uttarakhand province, northern India. Situated at 6,200 feet, the temperate climate at Nanital was a welcome relief from the incredible humidity and extreme temperatures of Salbani. It took them several days to get there via a train and a gary, which is a truck or a lorry, and... The photo album shows them relaxing, horseback riding, and boating on the large lake. While they were in Nanital, he learned that a tour of duty would now require 400 operational hours, up from 300, and this was probably not received with a lot of enthusiasm. There's a picture of Eric and his crew boating on the lake. Sad to say that with the exception of Warrant Officer Ferguson, all of these men would be involved in the ditching of KH-210 in about three or four weeks' time, and only two of them would survive. So while he was on leave, he got to see several films. And uh, here we are, there's The Invisible Man, or The Invisible Man's Revenge, I should say, and Destination Tokyo, and then Her Cardboard Lover, and a guy named Joe, Gaslight, and Song of the Open Road. Gaslight's a really good film, and uh, I think he saw it a couple of times. He arrived back at Salbani on the 20th of April, where 29 letters were waiting for him. And then he completed two more missions against stores and dumps. This is all part of the softening up for Operation Dracula, the retaking of Rangoon. On May 1st and 2nd, he was assigned back-to-back -back missions as part of the final push for the liberation of Rangoon before the monsoons hit, which would make fighting virtually impossible. The first mission was relatively uneventful, and KH-210 returned to Salbani around 6pm. The ground crew quickly prepared the aircraft with 14 500 pound bombs for a departure in the very early hours of the following morning. Eric stated that most of the crew had met their required operational quota by this time, though they had volunteered for this operation. Also, presumably, no one at the base would have been aware of the big news breaking in Europe that day that Hitler was dead having committed suicide on April the 30th in his bunker in Berlin. So here's the crew list for the flight. Squadron leader Gerald D'Souza was a captain and first pilot. Son of a wealthy Indian family, he was the youngest of six children and was one of the very few, possibly the only Indian, to have command of a bomber crew during the war. He was a very experienced pilot and highly respected by the squadron. He is referred to as Jerry in Eric's diary. Then Wing Commander James Nicholson, VC, he was on board as an observer. He'd been living in Yorkshire, England, and was married. He'd requested to join the flight ostensibly to further his studies into flying procedures in the approaching monsoon season, although there are some contradictory theories about whether his presence had actually been approved. One report suggested that he took the place of the artist Frank Wharton, and Flight Sergeant Mick Pullen, um, he was the co-pilot. Mick was from Melbourne, Australia, where he'd been a professional Aussie Rules football player before volunteering for the Air Force. Mick was married. And Warrant Officer Jack Spillard was the navigator from Tunbridge Wells in Kent, England, and he was married. And Flight Sergeant Donald Nicholson, he was the wireless operator. 
He was from Campbelltown, Tasmania, where he'd worked on his father's farm before enlisting. And Flight Sergeant Samuel Doherty was the second wireless operator from the Toronto area in Canada. He was known as Doc to the air crew, but Art to his family. He was married and had two children. He wasn't the regular wireless operator for KH-210, but he'd replaced Robert Plowman, known as Snowy, for their May 1st and 2nd missions. Snowy was recovering from a serious skin infection related to the climatic conditions in Salbani. Then Flight Sergeant Donald Cameron, he was a flight engineer and originally from Scotland. Flying Officer Brian Hill was the bomb aimer and also an air gunner. Brian was from Neath near Cardiff in South Wales, UK. Flying Officer John Calland, the mid-upper air gunner, was from Nelson in Lancashire, England. Sergeant Robert Taylor Bell was assigned to the ball gunner position. Bob was from Glasgow, Scotland. Sergeant Lawrence Helsby, or Larry, was in his usual position as the rear gunner. He was from Liverpool, England. And finally, Sergeant Eric Kitely was the nose gunner from Nuneaton, Warwickshire, England. KH-210 left Salbani around 1am. Most reports say 0045, but Eric's logbook says 145. On May the 2nd, for a mission against enemy gun positions, at Saigiyi in the outskirts of Rangoon. Here's some interesting footage from the UK Imperial War Museum of the raid. For Eric's plane, however, it would be a very different and a very tragic story. About an hour or so into the flight, Don Cameron, the flight engineer, reported that the outer port engine was on fire and so they feathered the propeller. Wing Commander Nicholson, who had been manually piloting the aircraft, gave his seat to the regular co-pilot, Mick Pullen. At 3.05, a message was sent by the wireless operator saying that they were turning back to base. They were about 130 miles southeast of Calcutta, over the Bay of Bengal, which would mean an estimated arrival time in Salbani around 6 or 6.30. However, the aircraft became very difficult to handle and required the full strength of both pilots to control, and they had to throttle back on the number 2, 3 and 4 engines to prevent it from rolling. Despite discarding the bomb load and everything else possible overboard, it became impossible to maintain altitude, and D'Souza reported that the other engines were, quote, going. He ordered the crew to prepare for ditching. Don Cameron and Eric, together with the rear and ball gunners, took up positions against the ball turret step, bracing themselves against the bulkhead. The aircraft rolled again without warning the starboard wing hit the water. The plane broke apart on impact and most of the wreckage sank in a matter of seconds. Eric was thrown into the water and as he came to his senses he tried to inflate his May West jacket but it had been punctured by the impact. There was a great deal of debris floating in the water. He wasn't a strong swimmer but luckily the nose wheel had broken free during the impact and was floating close by. Despite having a broken wrist, he tied the tapes of his jacket to the spokes. He saw flames about 50 yards away, which he assumed was debris from the burning aircraft. He heard shouts from Larry Helsby, the rear gunner, who was calling out to Don Cameron to join him. Don had located the box of emergency supplies. Mick Pullen, who'd been catapulted through the prospect front of the aircraft, was also in the water, clinging to one of the oxygen tanks. Eric shouted to Mick to join him at the nose wheel, but Mick swam away. As dawn broke, Mick and Eric had drifted apart, and neither man knew if anyone else had survived. Eric was suffering from multiple cuts, and splashed the water to frighten off approaching sharks. He saw his squadron returning to Salbani overhead. In fact, in response to the message sent by their wireless operator Don Nicholson, a search and rescue effort had been launched after KH-10 had failed to return to base as expected. A liberator from 292 Squadron was joined about an hour later by three Catalinas and a B-17 from the US 7th Emergency Rescue Service. The search continued all day 
until at 1724 one of the Catalinas sent a signal saying that they were landing at position 2120 north, 8904 east. They'd spotted survivors. As it approached, the float forced the nose wheel with Eric still tied to it under the water. After what seemed like an eternity, a crewman cut the straps and hauled him out. After 16 hours of floating in the water, Eric had been rescued. He was flown to Alipur and then taken to hospital in Calcutta. Mick Pullen was picked up by a second Catalina and was suffering from shock. After being taken to hospital in Akiab, he was transferred to the same hospital as Eric and put into the next bed. He was treated for burns and needed stitches in his chin after he'd been administered with penicillin which had only recently become widely available. He told Eric that he must have been hallucinating when he swam away from the nose wheel because he thought he'd seen Indians in a canoe trying to capture him. The body of Samuel Doherty was later recovered from the water, but despite an extensive search over three days involving 11 aircraft, none of the other crew members were found. Eric had injuries to his hand, foot, legs, neck and back. He gradually accepted the reality that he and Mick Pullen were the only survivors. His diary note reads, very lucky to be here. His diary entry for May the 8th notes the reaction to the news that Germany had surrendered. I imagine the muted response was in part due to the fact that in the minds of the troops in Southeast Asia, the war was far from over. While Eric and Mick were receiving medical treatment, just as the monsoon broke, Allied ground forces reoccupied Rangoon on May the 3rd without a fight. The Japanese had left the city, apparently leaving many POWs locked up in Rangoon jail without any food. Eric's squadron began airdropping supplies to the starving inmates. On May the 7th, his mother and his fiancée received telegrams. I've got remnants from both of, both of them and together I've got a complete copy. His younger sister later told me that she was at home when the telegram boy knocked on the door at 128 Hinkley Road and delivered the news. It read, We regret to inform you that your son, Eric Leslie Kitely, has been seriously injured during air operations and has been admitted to number 21 British General Hospital. His mother collapsed at reading it. Two close neighbours at 121 and 124 had already lost their sons to the war. While most of the country was celebrating the end of the war with Germany on May the 8th, his mother and his fiancée were left to wonder what seriously injured meant. A telegram with the same wording had also been sent to Mick Pullen's family in Melbourne, where Mick's mother was similarly upset. Here's a copy of the original draft. It would in fact take several days before the true extent of their injuries reached home. Here's a clipping from a local newspaper, which spelled his name yet another way. And also uh, his diary entry on the 23rd, where he found out the wording of the telegram that had been sent home. So while he was recovering, he saw several films, including The Fighting Sullivans, which is kind of like an early version of Saving Private Ryan. <clears throat> and then... Conspirators, and Frenchman's Creek. Meanwhile, Eric was recovering, and after about four weeks, he was sent to a rehab facility in Karnak Street in Calcutta before he returned to base on June the 14th, where he arrived at 1.30 in the morning and found someone sleeping in his bed, apparently. There were 20 letters waiting for him from home, um, plus one from Mrs. Nicholson. He was granted three weeks leave to aid with the recovery and after a few days in camp relaxing he left to go to Calcutta and then Darjeeling for some R&R &R in July. He recorded the films that he saw in June, Bathing Beauty, Laura, For Whom the Bell Tolls. 
The Suspect with Charles Lawton, Mummy's Ghost, Laura of the Tropics, Wing in a Prayer and Hollywood Canteen. So while Eric was watching Hollywood Canteen in Darjeeling, his squadron along with 159 and 356 squadrons attacked and partially destroyed the two bridges at Canchanaburi, or Canbury as it's sometimes called, which was a link in the infamous Death Railway built by POWs to connect Bangkok and Rangoon. There had been multiple attempts by the Allied Air Forces to destroy the bridges, but each time a span was felled, the POWs were forced to rebuild it. 12,000 POWs and between 80 to 100,000 forced Asian labourers died during the construction of the railway. The bridge was the inspiration for the fictional film The Bridge on the River Kwai. In Darjeeling he rode horses, went hiking, saw some more films. He returned to Calcutta on the 12th before returning to base where 28 letters were waiting for him. And then on the 14th he saw the medical officer Wilkins and was found fit and learned that he'd been recommended to return to the UK. However, a couple of days later he received and accepted a, an offer to take a course in Kashmir. So before leaving to go hiking he saw a couple of films. He saw Gaslight Again and The Yellow Canary. He left on the 18th and after a four day journey on trains and a truck he arrived in Srinagar on the 22nd. I used Google Earth to plot out his hiking trail through the Sindh River Valley. In Srinagar he stayed at the Lakeview Hotel and for several days went swimming, yachting, hiking and uh, enjoyed the scenery apparently. So they left Srinagar and had a hike to Kangan and uh, then the Wangit Valley and then back to Kangan, apparently a 14 mile trek. And some nice pictures here of Eric and his buddies taking a well-deserved bath after their day of hiking. So then on Monday the 30th of July they left Kangan for Gunt, which is 13 miles away. And uh, he got blisters on his feet apparently. Some nice pictures here of the camp in Gunt. So they left Gunt on the 1st and trekked 14 miles to Sunamarg. Apparently his blisters getting worse. They camped in Sunamarg for 10 days, taking day hikes. On the 7th he went to Glacier 2, and on the 8th he hiked down the Sunamarg Valley. There are some beautiful pictures in his photo album uh, where he documented the track. Here's the Thadjiwas Valley and the Thadjiwas Peaks. And a couple of shots of the Needle Nye Valley. A picture of Glacier or Glacier 2. So at this time Eric was blissfully unaware of what was going on in Japan because on the 6th of August the first bomb was dropped on Hiroshima and three days later the second atomic bombing on Nagasaki. On the 14th he left Sunamarg for Baltol which was the end of the trek and he stayed there for three or four days before returning to Sunamarg. On Wednesday, August the 15th, in the Sindh River Valley, somewhere around Sonomarg, they met a hermit who told them about the bombing and the Japanese surrender. He records having a celebration around the campfire until 2am with the rest of his friends. And the next day, he apparently had a terrible hangover. They left Sonomarg on Thursday, August the 16th and arrived in Srinagar, on the following Saturday, having hiked 187 miles. And this is where his diary entries stopped. From the entries and the photographs, it does appear that he thoroughly appreciated his time in Kashmir as he tried to put the recent past behind him.
A court of inquiry was set up to investigate the accident and to try and understand why the aircraft had become unstable so quickly. It should have been possible to fly the Liberator with one or even two engines out. The number one engine drives the suction pump which powers the instrument gyros. So the artificial horizon could have become compromised if the pilots hadn't have selected the backup pump on engine number two after number one was feathered. However, Mick Pullen's statement to the Board of Inquiry specifically refutes this, as did a strongly worded letter from the Allied Air Commander-in-Chief Southeast Asia, based on D'Souza's experience and record. D'Souza had reported prior to the ditching that he thought another engine was going. Eric told me that he believed the fire had been the result of flak damage during the previous mission, which spread to the second engine although there's no mention of this in official reports and no su supporting evidence. So the Court of Inquiry concluded that due to the lack of any hard evidence, the cause of the ditching was obscure, but linked to the engine fire. In October, Mick nominated Eric for membership of the Goldfish Club, which is exclusively for airmen rescued at sea. In a great example of understatement, the conclusion of the letter says, congratulations on your escape, and I hope you're none the worse for your experience. After spending Christmas 1945 with 355 Squadron in Salbani, he was released from active service on the 20th of April 1946, having been promoted to warrant officer. And then on Boxing Day, December the 26th, he married his fiancée and settled down to civilian life. He kept in contact with Mick Pullen in Australia until Mick's untimely passing in 1969 at the age of 48, following a heart attack playing golf. With the exception of Samuel Doherty, who is buried at the Bhawanipur Cemetery in Calcutta, the crew are memorialised in the War Memorial in Kranji, Singapore. The walls are engraved with 24,000 names of Allied personnel whose bodies were never found. On a layover in Singapore in 1991, I'd visited Kranji, and from the photographs I took, with the aid of a magnifying glass, Eric found each one of his crew. The photographs have since faded, but are still just about legible. For me, the really sobering takeaway from the memorial photographs is the age of the crew. Larry Howsby and Bob Bell were both 21. John Calland was the eldest at 36. Brian Hill was 28. Don Cameron was the youngest at 20. Jack Spillard was 34. Don Nicholson was 25. Joe D'Souza was 31, and James Nicholson was 29. Here's a plaque at the US Air Force Museum in Dayton for the 7th Emergency Rescue Squadron that were involved in the Catalina rescue of my dad. I'm going to do some more research into these guys. I had the opportunity to fly in a B-24 when the Cullings Foundation brought witchcraft to Dayton, Ohio a couple of summers ago. It had been previously identified as KH-191 and this aircraft had been delivered to RAF Squadron No. 8 in India in October 1944, which coincidentally was about the same time that Eric arrived in Salbani. I hadn't planned to take the flight but there was a seat available and I used my iPhone to record the experience as best I could. Uh, the noise was incredible, which probably explains why so many of the crews, including Eric, had hearing problems later in life. However, it did give me a brief insight into the conditions that the crews endured on what were some of the longest missions of the war. And I assume from the serial number that KH-191 and KH-210 were built around the same time.
Imagine having to live in there. I know. <laughs> That's what I wish. Talk about scary. So this is some public domain film taken from Solbani. This is the local egg store. A couple of guys enjoying cigarettes next to a straw roof. Could be interesting. This is a local transportation and also the local laundry. That's going to be hard on the clothes. And then maintenance area for a 355 Squadron Lib with the vertical stripes on the tail. And then this is a flight control. And air traffic control here. I'm not quite sure what P, W and F stands for. And then this is someone claiming a fighter I guess. <clears throat> and this is a briefing of 356 Squadron. According to the notes this is a briefing for a raid on Rangoon. And a note telling the guys not to forget their cookery knives and also to leave all their personal stuff back at the base. Uh, looks like they're unloading some ammunition here, perhaps from a previous mission. And here is an auxiliary fuel tank being installed for one of the longer missions. And here are some bombs being transported to the aircraft and loaded. So here's a shot uh, taken of Salbani, an aerial shot taken in uh, February 1944 with some liberators being prepped for an operation showing the runway. And this is Salbani today. It's now being used by the Reserve Bank of India and about 50% of the banknotes apparently in circulation in India are printed there. The final images are of my father and his grandson, also called Eric, at the Air Force Museum in Dayton, and also one of me and the nose wheel of the Collins Foundation B-24 in Dayton. I'm eternally grateful for the nose wheel and of course to the 7th ERS that rescued my father. 
I intend to do more research into this guy as it would be great to find out the names and faces of the rescuers. So one final comment, why were they called the Forgotten Air Force? Eric told me that the crews in the Burma campaign felt like they were very low priority in the planners' minds. The first priority of the British was to defeat Germany and the Americans wanted to bypass Burma in their war against Japan. The troops and air crews in India and Burma felt like they were always last on the list when it came to supplies, weapons, aircraft and general support. At home, the population at large weren't truly interested in what was happening in Southeast Asia. It really was a, fun, a forgotten campaign while it was underway and today probably even more so. There's a very moving entry in a book by Mike Jones, which is based on interviews with former airmen from Salbani. It reads, They gave their youth in order that future generations would be able to enjoy a liberty of mind. 141 souls from 355 and 356 squadrons gave their lives for that freedom. In closing, I'd like to give special thanks to author and historian Matt Poole, who provided a lot of background support and information for the making of this video. For further reading about RAF life in West Bengal during the war, I can recommend Matt's book, RAF Liberators Over Burma. Thanks for watching.